Hi, my name is Rod Cleef, and I'm the host of the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. And every week I interview multifamily rock stars, and we talk about how they built incredible wealth for themselves and their families through multifamily properties. So hit the like and subscribe buttons to get notified every Monday when a new episode comes out. Let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef and I am thrilled you're here. And I know you're going to get tremendous value from the gentleman we're interviewing today. His name's Brian Schimmel and he's, he's an insurance broker with Multifamily Risk Advisors. Uh, and we are going to talk about what's happening in the insurance space with what's happening in the world. So very excited to, to get into this with Brian. Welcome to the show, my friend. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. let's let's Lots. let's let's have some fun today. But uh, let's let's talk about the things that you're seeing with this, you know, with this el pink elephant in the room called COVID nineteen. So, um, I know that um, you know, and, and we talked before we started recording, and you're starting to see a little more crime happening, and with the mm -hmm. kind of unemployment that we have, that's going to happen. But talk about. What you're hearing, I know you uh, you insure somewhere between fifty to sixty thousand units, which is very significant. So you've kind of got your finger. How many are you? Is this nationwide or or where is? Yeah, it? I mean, you know, our agency, you know, consists of probably there's about about four principals here, and we we insure you know probably in the neighborhood of two hundred fifty thousand units around the country on a coast to coast basis. Hmm. So I think unlike you know a um. um you know, a lot of a lot of other agencies, I think we've got a pretty good feel from a geographical perspective, what's going on, you know, around mm -hmm. the country. Um, you know, that kind of takes us into a lot of our expertise. You know, we're real familiar, obviously, with all the catastrophic type coverages people have in a coastal area, you know, like you like mm -hmm. you know, there in Sarasota, um, mm -hmm. as well as you get into some of the Midwestern areas, you know, an entirely different set of risk and such. So we pretty much cover the complete um, um, country in terms of, of assets. I don't know if we have if we insure an asset in every state, but gosh, you'd be pretty close That's to quite it. a bit. So talk, yeah. talk about some of the things that you're seeing um, right now happening. Yeah. You know, I am seeing carriers tighten up from the coverages that they're willing to offer. The, the reality is, is in the insurance market right now, it was a seller's market, a hard market, as we call it, before COVID. And now that COVID has happened, it has tightened up somewhat, but there still is quoting that's taking place. The carriers, you know, have really, I've been impressed by the industry, how they've been able to shift, you know, and go from, we're always been such a brick and mortar type industry. We're the most antiquated of all industries, probably adopting, you know, technology, you know, less than most. And, but, you know, the industry's really been able to kind of shift gears. Everybody's working remotely, whether you're talking about underwriters, you're trying to communicate with London, whatever it might be. Deals, quotes are happening. Things are getting done. Yes, from a coverage standpoint, it is a little bit tighter sometimes to get some concessions from carriers, but they are still current. It really boils down, I think, at this point to relationships that you might have with the underwriters, you know, to be able to get things done. They're trying to prioritize their day. Um, that's in general what I would say what's going on with the market right now. Okay. What's happening with, with um, rates right now? Let's talk about rates and then, then let's talk about um, some of the coverages that are being explored with the crisis. But let's start with sure. rates. What's happening there? Okay. You, took, you take a look at your three core coverages on multifamily assets. You're talking about your property, your liability, and your excess coverage. You know, property rates in general are going up. Now, what has been occurring pre-COVID was at the same time that rates were going up, values were also being increased by lenders and even carriers. And so when you look at your property insurance premium, it's a factor of the insured value times the rate. And so when the rate's going up and the value's going up, your premium's going up significantly. Right. I haven't seen, but you know, at all, values drop yet, but you can only assume that in a market, you know, like this, that potentially you could see, you know, the values being decreased somewhat, which- Oh, no, there, there'll be some, there'll be some, some flatlining and probably some yeah. contraction for sure. Um, okay. And so the property, but how about liability in excess? Is that rate going up as well? Yeah, the liability markets right now, I think they're even a little more difficult than the, than the, than the property markets. It's just a very confined marketplace right now. Um, that, that's taking place. And, um, you know, what you're seeing a lot of is carriers trying to cover their bases from an exclusionary standpoint um, with things like assault and battery exclusions. 
you are trying to, you know, I'm not so much seeing the rate jump. I mean, it's a very unique market. Um, just yesterday, you know, I received a quote that was one of the lowest general liability quotes I've gotten on a property in probably a year. It really kind of surprised me, um, a Birmingham property. And so, but, you know, but, and this one was without, you know, it had no exclusions. That sounds no familiar. Exclusions. That sounds yeah. familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the asset I think we're looking at, I'm assuming. No, no? It's, it's not. I wish it was oh. for you, but it's okay. actually not your asset. It's okay, because we're asset. looking at one there too. Anyway, please yeah. continue. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, so you got this low premium, but, but did, you, did you notice there was an exclusion? No, not in this, oh, okay. which is okay. just super surprising. Okay. But okay. but let me give you the company line, the industry line. I would say in general, liability rates and, you know, are, are creeping up and exclusions are creeping in to many of the policies. Yeah. So, you know, okay. that's kind of um that's kind of what's occurring. And then your excess, you know, believe it or not, out of your property and liability, you know, carriers, it's the excess liability that is probably the most difficult out of them all right now in terms of you know, rate increases and everything, but pretty easy placement, but the cost, nobody feels real good about their excess liability costs right now. Right, right, um, right, right. But you so, know, but, you go ahead. No, I was going to say, but you know, it, it's, it's tough to really predict the fallout with this thing. You know, these insurance carriers invest so much money in the, the, the premium dollars that come in into the market. You know, the, there is a school of thought that you know, with the downturn in the market of where it is, maybe these carriers will start trying to bring in premium dollars and get it invested in the market on the rebound, you know, and that's mm-hmm. a, that's a very legitimate, you know, line of thinking um, mm-hmm. with regards to insurance rates. I mean, you know, rates in the insurance industry fluctuate somewhat like the stock market, but it's just over a much longer period. You know, when they mm-hmm. take a direction, they'll continue that direction for a quarter or a good part of a year, but then they'll start heading in another direction at some point. And I don't think anybody knows for sure right now. Interesting, interesting. So, you know, we've been looking at and paying attention to legislation that's coming around forcing the insurance companies to include, uh, you know, this pandemic in uh, loss of business income. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I'm sure some states and everything are going to try to enforce certain things, which are going Mm -hmm. to be challenged. I think the reality that everybody will be trying to get around is that the industry just does not have those dollars right. to pay these business income losses. It's just simply not there. You could mandate mm-hmm. they pay it, but the dollars are not there. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at that, that's kind of, a, it's very similar like terrorism insurance. Right. You know, when all of a sudden terrorism became, you know, um, um, you, you know, right after 9-11 became, you know, um, something that the carriers obviously excluded and that, that lenders wanted coverage for, you had a federal, you know, um, insurance program taking place with with terrorism, and um, and so now with each property, you know, your lender is going to mandate it. You purchase terrorism coverage, and it's you know it's not cheap, but it's not super expensive for that. But the the reason you have that is if you're talking about nuclear war or terrorism or pandemic, there is no way that these underwriters can even predict what that might look like. And if they can't back that up with data, they're not going to insure for it. And so I do not see carriers that are going to offer pandemic coverage. I don't think there's going to be a lot there, no matter what the states do about it. Um, But I do think there's going to be a few things come out of this. I think that you might have a pandemic type insurance coverage like terrorism that, Mm. that probably lenders will require. Um, You know, I also think that there's probably a good chance that the industry is going to contribute some sort of fund, uh, sum of money, you know, to the government, a fund or something to maybe pay out some of these losses in some way. I I think that could be a possibility, too. I just Mm. think what people have to wrap their head around is the scope of the business income losses. You would be talking about a very large percentage, if not 100 percent of all businesses (laughs) submitting to carriers um, for coverage. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, those dollars just aren't there. Yeah, they're uh-huh. not there. And uh, yeah, I, 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 that, that makes complete sense to me. So, yeah. um, and, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm thinking of Ohio, you know, they're talking about forcing that and, and but you're right, the money's, where's the money come from? You know, is, yeah. the, is, is, is then the government going to shore up the insurance industry? So, yeah. you know, uh, where does it stop? We okay. are, you know, well, I'm sure we've both said it many times about being in uncharted waters, but I think this is the definition of being in uncharted waters. But my, you know, my message, I think, to your, you know, viewers and listeners would be that deals are happening, quotes mm-hmm. are happening, things are occurring. 
yes, the pace has slowed up somewhat, but you know, I got a lot of my clients that are going back and revisiting deals that were that they maybe didn't get two, three months ago. Right. Maybe or that are coming five. that are coming back that they didn't get. Back. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely uh, agree with you. I, I mean, I've got students, quite a few students that have, that have posted in our Facebook group or called me and said, hey, this deal's coming back. We thought yeah. we'd lost it. We were sick that we lost it, and now we're getting it. And so, you know, a lot of that happening. Um, so, so, talk about, you know, when, a, when an operator uh, comes to you with, a, with, a, with an asset that they want to insure, you know, give some feedback or some some ideas and how they can maximize um, coverage and minimize cost, if there are any right. strategies at all around that. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think there are some strategies. You know, you, you, when you, again, getting back to your core, th- you know, three coverages, your property, your liability, and your excess. Let's talk about, you know, property first. You know, mm-hmm. what's going on in the property market right now? is that most carriers are imposing a 15 year age limit on roofs. Mm. So you're, um, you know, what they're doing specifically is uh, if, if your roof's older than 15 years, they'll cover it, but they want to factor in depreciation at the time of a claim. Mm-hmm. Some people are fine with that. The problem is no lenders are fine with that. Right. And so the roof ages are a very, very big deal um, okay. right now. And, um, um, You know, if your roofs are older than 15 years old, to find the coverage without depreciation, you could be paying a hefty price to an insurance carrier for that. There's very few carriers that are doing that. And so um, so from from that standpoint, um, you really need to pay attention to your roofs. Mm -hmm. You need to pay attention to wiring. This gets back Mm -hmm. to where I'm saying the carriers are tightening up a little bit. Um, If if you have aluminum wiring, you really want to know what um, remediation method was used. Was it mm-hmm. top alum, alumicon? Is it pigtailed? What is it? Ask your sellers for documentation of roof age and of wiring. Those mm-hmm. are two big physical factors of the asset itself. Um, you know, and then you can kind of get into obviously the loss history. It surprises me time and time again of how many per- people that are purchasing an asset don't ask for the loss, the seller's loss runs. The second that they get the property under an LOI. And truth be told, you know, three years ago, you could sometimes get a quote with limited loss history. In today's market, you need a full loss history of the property. How, how, how far back, how, how far back, the entire ownership cycle that the previous operator has? Five years is ideal. Five years. But okay. obviously, there are situations where the person, the, the company you're purchasing it off of, maybe they just bought it two years ago, and right. they probably can't go back two right. sellers deep to get those losses. Right. They need at least three years okay. Okay, of loss history. Five years is ideal, especially okay. if it paints a very positive picture over five years. Let we'll me put it this way. If, if you've got a big major loss in a three-year period, I would definitely search for five years to see if that doesn't improve your, okay. the risk profile somewhat of that property. Okay. You know, Interesting. Interesting. You know, the next factor is valuation. Remember how I told you that, um, you know, Property premium is the value times the rate. Well, the value is really most of the time determined by on a square foot basis. You know, are we talking $75 square foot, $85 square foot, whatever it might be, there is a per square foot valuation on it. And, you know, if you design the coverage properly, meaning like blanket coverage and such, which can be difficult to get in this market, but if you can get it, you can get a little bit more aggressive on some of your valuations and tend to drive your premium down somewhat. I mean, my point being is, you know, if if I can get a property with blanket coverage, what that allows you to do, let's look at a $10 million property with 10 buildings, a million dollars for each building. If I can get a blanket um, coverage for that property, if you were to have a partial loss, keyword meaning partial loss, you could access up to the full limits of the policy, the 10 million, to address a partial loss on one building. Okay, if you looked at the, if you looked at, at at most of your loss scenarios in multifamily, it's very rare that you lose every single building 100%. Yeah, there are very few of those every year. Right. Not saying they don't happen, but I'm. Just well, saying we had we had we had one come close from a tornado in in uh, yeah. 
in Beaver Creek, Ohio, but uh, it's yeah. finally coming online uh, right now. Eight buildings just came online, but but uh, a blanket there would have definitely benefited us. But we yeah. came out smelling like a rose anyway. But but still, yeah. you know, that would have definitely helped us. Yeah, and it makes it really kind of makes the whole claim process, to be honest with you, even flow quicker because everybody right. wants their money, right? Right. When you take the blanket coverage, you just remove so many questions out of the equation. So that's something we always strive for. Not always possible, but that's something that we always strive for. If you can get it, you can get a little bit more aggressive with your valuations. Um, you know, now you got to get it approved by Fannie and Freddie usually, right? right. They're, they're kind of the most stringent, right. but, um, you know, but they're usually comfortable on garden style apartments. You know, your typical stuff, $75 right. a square foot or so will usually, you know, in most areas will usually, you know, um, uh, meet their requirements. And so, you know, that's but you can't, but you can't rebuild for that. So, right. Just but, the argue, but the argument would be, I mean, um, you know, I had a guy most recently came out of the ground with a property from ground up. I think he built it for like $88 a square foot. Was his Well, that's really cost. good. Yeah. That's really good, actually. Uh, yeah, okay. and it was, a, it was a decent place, but it wasn't anything over the top or anything. Okay. I mean, I, you know, and, um, you know, and you're talking to an old builder here. I was a, okay. I was a builder developer for 10 years. So, you know, you always, you, you got all those infrastructure costs, all your fixed costs, the architectural costs, mm -hmm. foundations, sewer, electrical, all of those things kind of get rolled up into what he built at like $88 a square foot. So, you know, if you were to have a place blow away or burn down tomorrow, you know, you still got a lot of that infrastructure there, including the foundations and such. That makes sense. But, but granted, sense. yeah, I don't think many people could build. Now, mind you, he was able to build for 88 because he also served as his own general contract. Yeah. And, the, and, and you and, know, yeah. And, and so there are, there's always a story to everything, right? But, right. but you know, I would say, yeah, in, in, you know, in general, $75, $85 a square foot for a garden style apartment in the, in the Southeast seems to be, you know, the number that most people work with. But again, every property is different. That's like saying, you know, you know, just depends on the amenities, the, how many stories, the whole nine yards. So, so what other words of wisdom would you share with, with, you know, people that aren't as familiar with the insurance piece of multifamily investing that you think they should know when they're evaluating a property, you know, uh, valuing a property, uh, anything else that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, um, you know, in general, really looking at the, the profile of, of, of the tenants, you know, mm -hmm. of the property. And ironically, I think really looking at the loss history of, of, of a property. I mean, you'd be okay. surprised, you know, when you'd be surprised at what you can learn by looking at the types of claims that occur at a property. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. If I'm looking at a property and, um, you know, and it's had a uh, two stovetop fires over the past year and um, an assault and battery and a, and a slip and fall or two. I even get a mental image of that, that there's just some problems at this right. property. Right. And we all know that curing those take, take time, you take know, time and money. Yeah. Take time, take time and money. Yeah. And to factor those things in the other ones, I'm going to kind of bring up a point that I brought up earlier. And these are, these are what I perceive to be mistakes of, that I see some of my clients make. And that is pretending that the losses don't matter. Mm. The entire industry is built on it. You have to have them. There's never been a deal that's gone down that didn't have the losses. And so get them up front. Oh, because that's, that's good advice. You know, I had one last year, um, huge, huge property. I asked and asked and asked for losses. Told there, I was told there were none. I was told that they're coming, they're forthcoming. Um, I actually was able to get a quote subject to losses. I had to right. present losses. They said, all right, we'll get them from the seller. Three days before closing, they presented almost $5 million worth of losses. On it. Oh, God. Carrier uh, pull, the carrier pulled out of the, pull, pulled out of the whole deal. Wow. And, um, you know, three days before closing. And so, and it doesn't take $5 million. You might be surprised sometimes at what that number is. That number might be, five, six hundred thousand dollars might just throw it out of an underwriter's ability to offer a quote. Right. Wow. You know, they, they don't have to offer these quotes. They have parameters that they can operate. Sure, within. sure, sure. And, and, and that so, probably escalates to different people if, if, if they can do it yeah. at all. Right. And so get your hands on the losses. The other ones I see roofs. I see sometimes people think that they're not going to catch these roof ages hmm. between the appraisal, between the insurance carriers inspection I can assure you that the roof ages are going to surface 
and they're actually the most difficult one to actually determine because sometimes you have an inspection and mind you, the inspectors do not want to put themselves on a line and say, oh, this is a 2008 roof or 2010. They say roof looks good. I'm sure there's many years left in it fully functioning is, is what you read in the appraisal, but that doesn't work with the carriers. They don't care. They want an, they want an age. They want somebody to step up and say, this is a 2010 roof. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so you really need to get your hands on that. And the other one I've already talked about is, is, is wiring. Is the wiring. Yeah. Okay. You give me a, you give me a copper prop, a property with copper wiring, no losses and a relatively new roof on it. And, and even in this market, I'll get your quote back to you very quickly. Okay. Okay. And, and that's, that's okay. kind of what's occurring. Okay. We're going to take just a second to hear from our sponsor. Rob, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know you've been hard at work helping our warrior students do just that using our ACT methodology, which is awareness, close, and transform. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? You bet. Guys, we've been going nonstop for three years, building an amazing community of like-minded people. And our coaching students, which we call our warriors, have had extraordinary results. They've purchased thousands and thousands of units. And last year, we did over a thousand units with our students. And we're looking to grow this group and take it to the next level. We're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework that's really step-by-step step and then leverage our systems and network to raise equity, to find and close deals, and to build partnerships nationwide. Now, our warrior community is finding success in any market cycle. So, if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more of our incredible network and take advantage of the incredible opportunities that are coming very soon, apply to work with us at mentorwithrod.com or text CRUSH to 41411. That's mentorwithrod.com or text CRUSH to 41411. Listen, Brian, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. You've added a ton of value, and it's TBM uh, uh, is, is the other acronym for your company, uh, Multifamily Risk Advisors, big hitters in the insurance space. It's a pleasure to meet you face-to-face. -face. I know Good we're working you. on a deal together, and, uh, and uh, thanks, thanks for coming on, my friend. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yeah.